Mountains Eastern Time. Uh, everything on track, still uh, tracking a 20% probability of violation. That's 80% go. Weather looks good uh, and the range looks good for a launch this evening. Uh, that uh, 8.31 p.m. Eastern Time is the opening of a five-minute launch window. We're launching this uh, in August 2023, approaching the 10th anniversary of Cygnus-1, or Cygnus Orb D-1, the demonstration flight of Cygnus, and the first time that Cygnus birthed with the International Space Station. That spacecraft uh, was named after NASA astronaut G. G David Lowe, George David Lowe, this spacecraft, CRS-19, is named the SS Laurel Clark. Northrop Grumman is proud to name the CRS uh, NG-19 spacecraft in remembrance and celebration of the NASA astronaut. It is a company tradition to do so. Dr. Clark was an accomplished undersea medical officer and naval flight surgeon prior to her NASA career. During her first and only space flight, C C CST-107, Dr. Clark and the rest of the crew aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia tragically lost their lives on February 1st, 2003, when the shuttle did not survive re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Dr. Laurel Clark is remembered by the teams uh, that are supporting this mission from coast to coast. There are three uh, operation centers that are watching over uh, the mission today here in Mission Control Houston, uh, the International Space Station Flight Control Room, the destination of the Cygnus uh, once it separates from the Antares vehicle off of pad 0A and makes its journey uh, into orbit. We're watching and following along every step of the way. And of course, at the bottom of the screen there, you can see the two control centers that are looking after the vehicle you see on the pad at the Wallops Range Control Center. Uh, they're watching over the launch of Antares from pad 0 a over at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, and of course, Northrop Grumman's Mission Operations Center in Dulles, Virginia, once Antares delivers uh, Cygnus and the 8,200 pounds of cargo, including science and supplies, into orbit. Uh, it's a nine-minute ascent that Aceres will take uh, Cygnus into orbit. It'll be the folks you see there on the bottom left taking control of the vehicle through the flight to the International Space Station. And then enabling our ME1, ME2, TVC, and EHA buses. All agencies currently reporting green. You're looking at uh, the Antares rocket. On top of that is the Cygnus vehicle, CRS-19, delivering 8,200 pounds of cargo. Uh, fueling is wrapping up here. By the time we uh, we get to um, T0, it will be completely filled. You can see the LOX venting happening on the side of the vehicle right now. That's the oxidizer. Uh, Antares uses uh, RP-1 kerosene propellant and the liquid oxygen uh, oxidizer on the first stage. The second stage is a solid rocket motor. So that venting is part of the fueling process, and we'll continue to see that venting, uh, the billowing of the uh, cloudy smoke there on the side of the vehicle throughout the duration of the countdown to T-Zero. Again, we're going down to 8.31 p.m. We're watching all of this from the International Space Station Flight Control Room. You can see it on the center of our screen. We're following along every step of the way, and we will continue to do so throughout the flight of Antares and the flight of Cygnus to the International Space Station. For launch, the team's here here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room are led by Flight Director Marcos Flores. 
During the Orbit 3 shift, Marcos uh, has the uh, responsibility of the International Space Station and overseeing all the operations on board while the crew is in a sleep period. No Capcom today. If the crew needs anything during their sleep period, it'll be Marcos answering the call. The visiting vehicle officer is Ray B. Janess. It is his job here in Mission Control Houston to communicate with the teams that you saw earlier in uh, Dulles, Virginia, the Northrop Grumman teams, and be working with them every step of the way to make sure Cygnus is making its incremental steps to rendezvous with the International Space Station for an on-time launch today. We're looking at a Friday morning rendezvous and uh, berthing to the International Space Station. Ray uh, will be watching the operations here uh, for this leg of the trip. LC prop two in work. Now, currently in a sleep period, though they may be waking up, it's uh, midnight GMT aboard the International Space Station, but uh, they could be tuning into this coverage. Um, it is their sleep period, though, so uh, they may be getting some well-deserved rest for the operations to uh, capture and berth the Cygnus to uh, the space station on Friday. From left to right, we have Frank Rubio, NASA astronaut, uh, Dimitri Patelin of Roscosmos, Sultan al Nayadi of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we have Woody Hoberg there in the center frame. NASA astronaut. Right to his right is NASA astronaut Steve Bowen. Andrei Fedyaev is the Roscosmos cosmonaut to the right of Steve Bowen. And then rounding out the crew, the International Space Station's commander, Sergei Prokopiev. All seven are on board the International Space Station right now, uh, taken to the space station by a crew dragon and a Soyuz vehicle. Of the uh, of this crew, it will be uh, Woody Hoberg and Frank Rubio uh, to perform the capturing operations for uh, Cygnus on Friday. Two, check three D eight, three D nine, and site control step three ninety one. You go to arm tail for rapid retract. And in work, I will report back in approximately ten minutes when it's complete. Copy that site control. LC ops one TVC and EJ buses enabled. Roger ops one check three ninety. Here you can see a graphic of the Cygnus spacecraft and the Antares launch vehicle in its uh, stacked configuration. Again, Antares is a two-stage rocket. It's got the uh, liquid uh, oxygen oxidizer and RP-1 kerosene uh, fueled on the first stage. Second stage is a solid rocket motor, and of course, uh, Cygnus will be following along. Uh, the deployment of those ultraflex solar arrays happens about two and a half hours after uh, its insertion into orbit. Those will collect the uh, power it needs to uh, fuel its service module for the remainder of its flight to the International Space Station. We need another minute or two. We need another minute or two. Okay, copy that. Stage Cygnus has a late loading uh, operations capability for the uh, Antares 230 Plus. Uh, the top of the fairing has a pop-top fairing to allow late loading uh, in this specialized uh, facility here during the uh, phase where the vehicle is horizontal. Uh, that pop-top fairing allows for any late loading capabilities. We did get word uh, that the uh, part of the late load was some uh, frozen treats that we tried to poke at what kind of frozen treats, whether it was ice cream or popsicles for the crew. Uh, it is a secret for the crew, so that was part of the late loading operations. Ops 2 set stage 1 controller EPV VREFs. LC Ops 2 stage 1 controller EPV VREFs has been set. Copy that. And uh, system you go for step 399, coordinate final adjustment to payload ECS temp send point, report back when complete. LC in work. LC system, countdown one. Go ahead, system. Yeah, LC uh, step 399 complete. Copy, 399 complete. Launch team, we've just passed uh, L minus 20 minutes and counting. Okay, you're hearing the uh, 
countdown from you're hearing the countdown net over at Wallops Island from the Wallops Range Control Center going through the methodic milestones. Uh, we're 20 minutes away from launch. Everything's looking good as the vehicle transitions to internal power. Uh, while we wait and continue to flow through these milestones, we do have a special guest on the line with us to talk to talk us through some of the things that are happening. Uh, first, we have Christina Halona and Terry Systems Engineering Program Manager at Northrop Grumman. Christina, do we have you? Hi, Gary. Yes, you do have me. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, and many thanks to everyone joining us today to see a successful and Terry's launch and Cygnus mission to the International Space Station. Thanks for joining us, Christina. It's been a bit to get this uh, vehicle uh, in its position that we see now. Can you take us through uh, what it took to get Antares into this vertical position, specifically the rollout? Sure. Um, this is uh, Northrop Grumman's 19th mission, as you had stated before, and it definitely takes the entire Northrop Grumman team from Chandler, Arizona, and Dallas, Virginia, months and months to get the uh, Antares 230-plus vehicle ready for launch. Um, it definitely starts with the vehicle being manufactured there at the Horizontal Integration Facility, which we call the HIF, at uh, Wallops uh, Fight Facility. And then uh, we roll out the uh, Antares rocket to the Pad 0A. Um, it's definitely a rain or shine event. Um, thankfully, this week we rolled out um, Antares to Pad 0A, and where we have several engineers, um, about 20 ish, 30 ish people um, from various disciplines, and they all walk with the right, vehicle well, from the HIF to the pad. Um, it takes the, the entire team are looking while they're walking out with the rocket, they're making sure that Ontario stays level the entire way. We have a requirement where we have to stay within a one degree side to side requirement on the entire rollout. And the whole process takes about two hours for Ontario to make the trip from the hip to the pad. Um, and that's all due to the slow pace of the vehicle taking, um, taking the vehicle on the truck. And we go a staggering two miles per hour. So as you can tell, it's two miles per hour is pretty slow. So, um, but we want to make sure we get it to the pad safely and uh, once it's there we undergo some more testing on the on the vehicle and then it's eventually loaded and then prepped for launch and it certainly did look like a beautiful day you got really lucky with the rollout there uh, awesome to see some of that footage you know this is not the first time you've done this as you mentioned it's been a while you're coming up on 10 years since uh, Cygnus's demo mission to the ISS and more than 10 years since Antares made in flight on April 21st 2013 when you look back at all that's been accomplished over these 10 years what sticks out to you you have 16 successful flights you've been upgrading the Antares incrementally over these years what really sticks out to you as you reflect on these past uh, 10 years um, the one thing that Northrop Grumman's very happy to share is that Antares has carried approximately 130,000 pounds of cargo to the International Space Station, and our Cygnus spacecraft in total have hauled away about 91,000 pounds of waste. So, like you said, over the years we have extens expanded the capabilities of Antares and Cygnus to increase uh, our cargo capabilities. We perform late loads. We also offer reboot services and perform various secondary missions as well. So. Here at Northrop Grumman, we definitely understand the importance that the resupply missions are um, not only to NASA, but their astronauts and the critical research that we've done on the, aboard the ISS. You know, there's been so much, you know, advances of technology that have come from their research in space, and we're definitely honored to be a part of it and excited for the, all the missions to come and this one for today, for sure. Very good. And we're hearing some of the milestones in the background. The countdown is continuing. Uh, Cygnus's transition to launch mode. We're getting ready to send CRS-19 uh, to the International Space Station, named the SS Laurel Clark. I wonder if this, uh, this Cygnus, this vehicle, this mission, and the name uh, have any personal significance to you, um, something that you tie very closely to this specific mission. Hi, Gary. Yes, actually, it was I was an undergraduate student at uh, Arizona State University when Dr. Laura Clark uh, was picked to be an astronaut. And, you know, being a Navajo woman and studying aerospace engineering, along with countless other STEM, you know, women around the world who are wanting to pursue um, their engineering degree, degrees, it was... You know, it was Laurel, you know, she was an astronaut, she was a medical doctor, a U.S. Navy captain, 
a space shuttle mission specialist. And, and the thing that was very special to me is that she was also a fellow astronaut group 16 classmate of, of one of my mentors, um, who is a retired astronaut, Dr. John Harrington of the uh, Chickasaw Nation, who was the first Native American in space. So she really had a, a, tight, a tight bond with her entire class. And, and just knowing that cousin really stuck out to me. And, you know, it's her incredible accomplished career and passion for the research in space that helped me cement my work in the aerospace industry. And, you know, it's been 20 years since Columbia's space shuttle tragedy and um, where Laurel and six other astronauts lost their lives. And, you know, it's just been amazing to witness Dr. Clark's career achievements that took her career to under the sea and to the stars, basically. And, you know, she and the entire Columbia crew of the STS-107 continue to inspire, you know, future generations of explorers. And Northrop Grumman is proud to commemorate our NG-19 Cygnus spacecraft, the SS Laura Clark, for the NG-19 mission, where she has made a substantial contribution to the United States commercial space program and to human space flight. So we're very honored to um, to have it named after her and just a very special place in, in my heart for her and, and the entire crew of the STS-107. And I think that special place is shared amongst the teams that are supporting this mission. Christina Halona, thank you so much for uh, joining us for the launch show. And we're continuing down uh, towards the T-0 here at uh, 831. Thank you for coming on, Christina. All right, thank you. And as mentioned, uh, as we were talking with Christina, uh, the milestones for counting uh, this mission down to T-0 have been moving along. Okay, uh, launch team LC, we're coming up on uh, our pole to proceed with final countdown. This is step 414. GSO? GSO is go. RSO? RSO's go. TD? TD's go. Prop lead? Prop lead's go. Stage one. Stage one is go. MES one. MES one is go. GCE. GCE is go. ACE. ACE is go. Mars. Mars is go. CMD. CMD go. LD. LD is go. NG. Northam Grumman is proud to honor accomplished NASA astronaut, medical doctor, U.S. Navy captain, and space shuttle mission specialist, Dr. Laurel Clark. Laurel was a passionate contributor to the space program, improving our understanding of spaceflight effects on the human body. Her crew's successful completion of 80 experiments on the STS-107 mission advanced the bioscience knowledge of plant growth in space. A proud and dedicated wife and mother, Laurel spent most of her free time during the mission conversing with her family. But when she did get time to look out, she described it as glorious. It is therefore an honor to return her legacy to space to once again enjoy the view is the SS Laurel Clark and Northrop Grumman are go for launch. Copy that. We are good to proceed with final countdown, check step 414. Godspeed, Patrick James. And with that, we pass the 10 minute go, no go poll for CRS 19 to lift off on time this, uh, this evening. Hey, all stations, uh, and the engine evacuation started pitching back as. Check your your headsets and mics. You might have a hot mic. And the engine evacuation started. Copy that, Ops 2. CMDLC, countdown 1. So in the final 10 minutes of this uh, countdown, we'll be following along uh, through the milestones to get uh, Antares prepared for launch. Some of the ones coming up to listen out for in particular at T-5, Antares switches to internal power. Cygnus at this time is uh, switched to its launch mode. 
Uh, T-minus 3 minutes 30 seconds as an auto sequence handoff. The terminal count. Uh, computers at this point will take over for the final steps through launch. And at T-minus 40 seconds, the tanks are pressurized uh, for en engine ignition at T-0. And we're tracking down to 8, uh, 8.31 and 14 seconds p.m. Eastern Time. LC, MES-1, vacuum verified in the fuel circuits. Okay, MES-1, I copy that. We'll check 416 complete. Live shots of the liquid rocket engines that will mix RP-1 and kerosene LC and uh, liquid LC oxygen. To go to enable ACS VDMs. LC Ops-1, ACS VDMs, internal power on. LC Elec-1, ACS VDMs enabled, voltage nominal, ODM commands are clear. Copy, Elec-1, we'll check uh, step uh, 417 and 418. A little bit about what to expect for Antares ascent. Uh, it's a two-stage rocket, so the liquid uh, oxygen uh, or the liquid uh, propellant will burn on the first stage for th about approximately three minutes, 18 seconds until main engine cutoff, and then enter into a coast stage uh, with first stage separation about three minutes, 24 seconds, and fairing uh, fairing separation at three minutes, 54 uh, seconds. There's an interstage separation and then the stage two ignition after four minutes. And this uh, stage two is a solid rocket motor that burns for two minutes and 44 seconds. After another coast period, the spacecraft will separate from the second stage shortly after nine minutes uh, to insert uh, Cygnus into orbit. Captain Copy. LC top three, we have step 421, VTSO activation verified. Cap that, check 421, ops two, initialize ground ordnance power supplies. Ground ordnance power supplies initialized. LC elect one, ground ordnance power supplies are nominal. Copy that, elect one, check 422 and 423. T-minus uh, six minutes and counting. The sun is setting on the east coast there. And Terry San Cygnus illuminated by the floodlights on the launch pad. That's pad 0A at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. Time 00, 25, 03. Copy that, check 425 complete. CMD, step 413, Cygnus is launch mode and nominal. Copy that, CMD. Site control, can I get a call on 424? Uh, you can, LC. I can confirm at ECS transferred at GN2. Copy that, check 424 complete. 
5 minutes 15 seconds Cygnus inside the fairing that you see at the top of the rocket there behind the American flag is configured for launch. Ops 2 LC step 426 should go to initiate engine priming. Engine priming started. Copy that. Ops 1 transfer avionics to internal power. LC Ops 1 all internal power on, all external power off. LC Elect 1 internal power nominal. Ops 1 open FTS umbi loop. FTS umbi loop open and green. FTLU and FTS receiver indications are nominal. Ops 1, you go to send all arm command. LC Ops 1, all arm command sent. LC Elect 1, safe in arms, and ODMs are all armed. NASA TV, report range status. Range is green. LC MES 1, priming verified. Copy that, MES-1, check step 434. Inside four minutes from launch, the team's reporting that the range is green, and Terry's mates a southeastern track uh, down the eastern seaboard and across the Atlantic. If you're on the east coast, uh, the, there are maps that allow for certain visibility of Antares, and in this night sky, you may get a good view, though we are hearing it is a bit hazy on the upper altitudes, so there might be some cloud coverage that prevent sightings, but for those that are close to the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport over on Wallops Island, uh, there may be some sightings to the first leg of ascent. Three minutes, 15 seconds and counting. LC, ELEC-1, FC commanded to flight mode. Copy that, check 437. Elect 1 to LC, auto sequence startup. Copy, Elect 1, be advised you're coming in faint. ODM bus voltages and currents are nominal. Copy that, check 438 and 439, and GNC1, verify ready for nav mode. Uh, LC, GNC-1, ready for nav. Copy that, Ops-2, switch to nav. LC, Ops-2, switched to nav. Check 441. Uh, LC, GNC-1, uh, nav mode verified. Copy that, we'll check 442. And we're at T-minus two minutes and counting. T-minus one minute, 30 seconds. T-minus one minute. T-minus 30 seconds. T-minus 
minus 10. Five, four, three, two, one. Carries in United Bonds Group, all possibility. And Terry's taking Northrop Grumman's commercial resupply mission 19 into orbit to the International Space Station. Flight controllers reporting a nominal ascent for Antares. Attitude nominal. Core pressurization is nominal. Engines remain at 100% thrust. We're steady. Stage 1 TBC is nominal. Attitude nominal. Vehicle attitude remains nominal. Power is nominal. A uh, vehicle passing through max Q. Vehicle now passing through max Q. Max Q is the maximum dynamic pressure experienced on Antares. Core pressurization valves are nominal. Engines remain nominal and steady. LCA, your go. Godspeed, Antares. And thank you, LCA. Halfway through the burn, 100 seconds to Miko, passing to 30,000 feet. Attitude nominal. Attitude remains nominal. Engine remains nominal, steady at 100%. Passing through 5,000 feet per second. Core pressurization remains nominal. Electrical power is nominal. TVC remains nominal. Engines remain nominal. Electrical power is nominal. Core pressurization is nominal. We're approximately 40 seconds from Miko. Slow throttle down has begun. Attitude nominal. TVC free set down slew has started. Attitude remains nominal. Three minutes into the flight of Antares, we got about 15 seconds until main engine cutoff. Rapid throttle down, steady 55% thrust. And we have main engine cutoff. Ellis is taking care of business. We have stage separation. Switching to animation with confirmed stage separation as we lose Antares into the clouds on this hazy ACS evening. Is enabled. ACS stage, is enabled. Stage two ignition time expected at uh, mission time 2.46. Stage one ignition expected in probably six, stage two ignition expected in approximately ten seconds. The fairing is separated. And Terry's currently in a coast phase. Stage two ignition and TVC battery is nominal. Second stage solid rocket motor has ignited. Power remains nominal. The stage will burn for two minutes and forty four seconds. The Caster 30XL will burn for approximately 2.5 minutes. Power remains nominal. Stage 2 TVC is nominal. Flight controllers report reporting good performance on the second stage. 
power remains nominal. TVC remains nominal in stage two. And power is nominal. We are approximately 100 seconds from stage two burnout. Attitude still nominal. Attitude remains nominal. TBC is performing nominally. Power remains nominal. Stage 2 TBC remains nominal. Power is nominal. TBC remains nominal. 50 seconds to stage 2 burnout. TVC, electrical power remain nominal. TVC and power remain nominal. I'm beginning to see tail off in the motor pressure, and we have stage two burnout. Six minutes, 55 seconds into the flight. The second stage solid rocket motor has burned out. ACS enabled. Or ACS payload enabled. We're now entering about approximately a two-minute coast phase. Antares is in orbit and will coast for roughly 100 seconds prior to payload separation. Seven minutes, 45 seconds into the flight of Antares. After spacecraft separation, it will take approximately two hours, 30 minutes uh, until the solar arrays are unfurled to start collecting power uh, for the Cygnus vehicle. Shortly after spacecraft separation, we'll have a representative from the International Space Station program online to provide some comments on the flight of Antares and uh, some comments on Cygnus's journey to the International Space Station. We'll plan to wrap our coverage shortly after orbital insertion, but please stay tuned uh, for updates online on the solar array unfurl. Spacecraft separation is uh, coming up on 30 seconds. Power remains nominal. Vehicle continues to coast prior to payload separation. And we have payload separation. And the flight control teams confirm the visuals you're seeing here on the animation. Cygnus has separated from the Antares second, second stage, flying free and beginning its journey to the International Space Station. All right, launch team LC on uh, Countdown Net. Uh, we're going to go ahead and proceed with our post-launch checklist. We've confirmed that we've had Cygnus uh, separation. Congratulations to the Cygnus team, and that uh, sound you heard a little earlier was a mic drop.
you're getting a live view of the wallet's range control center. These are the this is the team that was overseeing the launch of Antares from Pad 0A over at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. You can actually see in the back row there, uh, International Space Station Program Manager Joel Montalbano, the pink shirt with the red tie, congratulating the teams and overseeing a successful launch of 8,200 pounds of cargo to the International Space Station. Meanwhile, in Dulles, Virginia, the journey has just started for the flight control team over in the Mission Operations Center there. They'll be overseeing Cygnus's journey to the International Space Station over the next few days. Of course, uh, the operations today were executed by the team you see on the screen here, International Space Station Flight Control Room. We've been monitoring uh, every step uh, of the countdown and, and Terry's flight and delivery of Cygnus into orbit. Successful delivery from Wallops, thanks to the Wallops Range Control Center team there, all shaking hands and congratulating each other. And of course, Northrop Grumman Mission Operations Center, they'll be overseeing Cygnus's flight, as well as us here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room to ensure a safe journey over the next uh, couple of days until Friday morning uh, when Cygnus arrives at the International Space Station and is captured by the station's robotic arm. Now, after a successful operation this evening, uh, we were, are lucky enough to have Jeff Arendt, who is the manager of the Systems Engineering and Integration Office and the International Space Station Program based here in Houston. Jeff, how do you hear us? Loud and clear, Gary. How do, you, how do you hear me? Hey, loud and clear. Thank you for joining us, Jeff, and providing some remarks. We just saw Antares deliver 8,200 pounds of cargo, including science and supplies, to the uh, into orbit, and it's on its way to the International Space Station. I'm curious, from your perspective, from the International Space Station program perspective, what are some of the key highlights of science, hardware, something on this vehicle, uh, something on this mission that you're particularly looking forward to arriving at the International Space Station? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I think three come to my mind pretty quick. Uh, the first would be this is the, the final iteration of the Sapphire series of spacecraft fire protection experiments. And so that's flying on this flight. Um, that's been a really interesting set of experiments, and, and we've learned a tremendous amount, to be honest with you. Uh, the second, I think, uh, we're flying some neural cells. Uh, that will be cultured in 3D cell models for gene therapy testing. The experiment is called Neuronix. Uh, gene therapy shows promise, but the 3D, 3D models needed to test these therapies do not form in Earth's gravity. So creating these 3D, 3D cell cultures in microgravity could provide a critical platform for drug discovery and gene therapy testing. So really, really cool stuff. Uh, the last would be we're actually flying on a new potable water dispenser. Uh, we're actually calling it our exploration portable water dispenser. It provides hot water and, and improves sanitation uh, for, for the crew's use. Uh, this will double the number of water dispensers that we have on board and certainly speed up meal preparation. Because I think as you know, and most of our listeners know, uh, because rehydration uh, is required for so many of the crew's meals, having, having one dispenser I'm sure takes a while for meal meal prep. So I'm sure the crew will be very excited about that. Yeah, I'm sure if they had any direction into what gets installed first, I'm sure they would choose that one just so they can get a couple of snacks early. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Jeff, we're, uh, we're coming up on 10 years since Cygnus won uh, with Orbital Sciences in September of 2013. Um, when Cygnus birthed first to the International Space Station for a demonstration mission. Now we're 10 years into it. We're talking about the Commercial Resupply Services 19 mission. So if you reflect on the past decade, what can you say about the impact of commercial cargo operations for International Space Station and continuing to support the operations? Yeah, in a word, uh, I'd say essential. Um, critically essential. I don't think that's almost redundant, but... Um, you know, with the retirement of the space shuttle, we lost our capability to resupply the ISS. And uh, cargo resupply from U.S. companies is critical to our mission. I can't emphasize that enough. It ensures our national capability to deliver critical hardware, science research, 
um, significantly increases the ability of NASA to conduct new investigations. Um, other U.S. government agencies, private industry, and academic and research institutions can also conduct microgravity research through our partnership with the International Space Station National Laboratory. But again, in a word, it's absolutely essential. It's essential for the operations and continuing operations. I think for this particular mission, there's also a sentimental value to it. And as, as you know, seeing the spacecraft get named after um, uh, significant significant contributors to um, human spaceflight. And this one is named after Laurel Clark, who tragically lost her life aboard Space Shuttle Columbia in 2003. And it can be a reminder of the risks of human spaceflight and the work that has been done over the past 20 years to continuously improve missions safety and assurance. So after today's successful launch and you reflect on the risks of human spaceflight, what can you say about maintaining a level of vigilance and NASA's role in working with private companies to ensure lessons in safety are shared and implemented? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, uh, uh, you know, my hat's off to Laurel and, and, and her entire crew and, and, uh, you know, we'll never forget those guys. Um, you know, focusing on the fact that safety is a top priority at NASA and the lessons learned are deeply embedded in our culture. We share our lessons learned with the younger generations as they enter the workforce, and we work collaboratively collaboratively with our commercial partners to ensure the lessons are passed on and openly shared and implemented to ensure our future success in human spaceflight. The, the other thing I'd add is following the Columbia accident, NASA formalized an additional level of diligence uh, by defining institutional technical authorities for safety, engineering, and crew health. These senior engineers and doctors work to ensure all concerns are heard and work to resolution not only for NASA hardware, but in an ever-expanded role to ensure our lessons learned are shared with both our commercial and international partners. You know, what we do is not easy, and uh, yeah, you just got to keep your nose down. Powerful words, Jeff, and I think it's uh, a testament to the success of this launch. It makes it looks easy that we just lift off the pad and go into orbit, but certainly a lot of work was put into it. Jeff Aaron, thank you so much for joining us to, uh, for today's coverage and providing these remarks. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks so much, Gary. Appreciate it. That was Jeff Aaron, manager of Systems Engineering and Integration Office at the International Space Station Program. With that, we will begin concluding our coverage for today's launch. Again, uh, Cygnus is in orbit after a successful orbital insertion by the Antares launch vehicle, and it will make its journey to the International Space Station rendezvousing Friday uh, for a capture and berthing. You can tune into our coverage then on uh, Friday morning. We'll begin our coverage at 4.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we're expecting the capture by the robotic arm controlled by Woody Hoberg, the prime robotic arm operator, and backed up by uh, Frank Rubio at 5.55 a.m. Eastern Time, 4.55 a.m. Central Time on Friday, August 4th. Now, since this is a berthing operation, we'll break our coverage and begin the installation coverage at four at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 a.m. Central, uh, where Cygnus will be maneuvered by the station's robotic arm and berthed to the Unity port of the International Space Station. This is the center uh, node that is uh, part of the International Space Station and the common home for Cygnus vehicles that arrive aboard the orbiting complex. Now again, uh, we're about to wrap up our television coverage, but stay tuned online for updates on the unfurling of the Ultraflex solar arrays on, on the Cygnus that will provide power for its journey uh, and arrival at the International Space Station on Friday morning. Now for now, that will wrap up our coverage here in Mission Control Houston. Thank you for joining us. It's a new era of pioneers, star sailors, thinkers, and adventurers. Three, two, one, zero, all engine running.
Let's go. 